Hi, I'm Fiona Branton, president of the Harvard Law School Forum, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. We are very pleased to have with us Joyce Brown from New York with her attorneys, Norman Siegel, who is the executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union, and Robert Levy, who is a staff attorney with the Civil Liberties Union in New York. Introducing our guest tonight is Dan Greenberg, who recently joined the law school as director of the clinical programs. Before he came here, Mr. Greenberg did public service work in New York City, where he met and became friends with Norman Siegel. I'd like to present Dan Greenberg. Thank you. Well, as Fiona said, um, for 16 years on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, I was the managing attorney of a legal services office. Uh, that was from 1971 until I came to Harvard in October of this year. In 1978, we were faced with finding a project director for MFY Legal Services and got a number of resumes, and included in one of the resumes was somebody who had a heavy civil liberties background, a man by the name of Norman Siegel. Now, I can tell you that notwithstanding the perception that all public interest work is the same, there is a difference between being a member of the Civil Liberties Union and being a legal services lawyer. Uh, legal services lawyers tended to characterize civil liberties lawyers as people who would argue, in the words of, of someone I know, uh, for ages on how many policemen can dance on the head of a minority person. And we saw ourselves as, as legal services lawyers somewhat tending to be more involved with what we call the real life problems that people had. Notwithstanding that, we hired Norman, and Norman went on to be be one of the finest directors of our program. I say that as an introduction to Norman because in the brief remarks, I wanted simply to note that as somebody who's been involved for 20 years in public interest work, it is somewhat astounding and I think remarkably wonderful that the Civil Liberties Union is in the foreground of the fight for homeless people and that the Civil Liberties Union of New York has recognized the problems that poor people have as compared to the problems that historically they have looked at, problems of whether you could print the plans for the atomic bomb in the progressive magazine. Um, there's something wonderful about seeing the Civil Liberties Union defending the people who they're defending and being involved in the struggles in which they're involved. So it's a particular pleasure for me to begin the evening by introducing to you my good friend Norman Siegel. Uh, thank you very much, Danny. Uh, I'm going to actually let uh, 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 Rob begin, and, but before I do that, I just want to tell all the students here that you really should get to meet and know Danny Greenberg. He's really the best. He was a great lawyer in uh, the Lower East Side. And I think that uh, uh, the New York City public interest community's loss is Harvard's gain. And it's always a pleasure to be on the same platform with Danny. I now introduce to you Rob Levy. Good evening. Uh, you should think of me a little bit uh, and this, I'm not trying to be too facetious, but pretend that you're coming to a rock concert and uh, you're waiting for the main event and you know that the band is going to be coming, coming out at some point, but you really need to hear that warm-up band just to, to know how good the real band is going to be. Uh, and that, in a way, is what a lawyer does uh, in this situation. I'm, I'm here to set the stage for Joyce Brown, to, uh, as in a medieval play, to narrate the beginning, tell you a little bit about what the facts of the case were, adjust the lighting, make you comfortable in your seats, and then you'll hear from Joyce Brown and from Norman Siegel. What I'd like to do is provide some factual and legal background about the social issues and the, and the trial in this case, and then I'd like to pose some questions to you, which I don't expect to fully answer for you, and I don't expect you to fully answer my, uh, to fully accept my answers, but I do hope that they'll give you another way of looking at some of the problems of homelessness and society's responses, particularly New York City's responses to those problems. On the surface, the Joyce Brown case seems fairly simple. She was a homeless person. She'd lived on the street for a year and a half. On October 28, 1987, she was forcibly removed from the street by the New York City police and by a team of roving mental health workers called Project Help. She was then taken to Bellevue Hospital where she was confined against her will for 84 days. 
Uh, she was the first person confined under New York City's policy to round up mentally ill homeless people, a policy which Mayor Koch said was the most important program of his administration. Uh, and she became the unwitting symbol of this program. She petitioned for her release. She won a trial in front of the trial judge. She uh, should have been released, but within two hours, the city was in front of the appellate court, which said that she would have to remain in the hospital until the appeals court could make a decision whether she should be released. That decision took over six weeks, and in a divided 3-2 decision, it was decided that she should remain in the hospital. We then appealed to the Court of Appeals of New York State. That case was fully briefed and argued, but in the meantime, before the issue of whether or not she was properly in the hospital was decided, the city went ahead and tried to have her for forcibly medicated. A hearing was held on that issue, she won the hearing, and she was released in January 1988 because the city said if it couldn't drug her, there was no point in keeping her in a hospital. While she was at Bellevue, she was kept in a locked ward with 27 other homeless people. She was never allowed to leave the ward except to go to court or to have a blood test, not even to spend three hours at Thanksgiving dinner with her psychiatrist who thought it might be a nice thing for her. For some time after her admission, she was prevented from speaking with reporters or any person from the press, even though New York City had issued numerous press releases in which they described her variously as psychotic, paranoid schizophrenic, delusional, and a person who is unable to care for herself. In her chart was the so-called clinical justification for not allowing her to talk to the press. A psychiatrist wrote that in his clinical opinion, it would exacerbate her delusional belief that she was being unfairly incarcerated. Ultimately, the trial judge said that was ridiculous and allowed her to, to have access to the press. Before a final ruling was made whether the legal requirements for involuntary hospitalization were met, the hospital, as I mentioned before, tried to obtain court orders to force her to undergo intrusive and invasive treatment, and in some cases, painful medical procedures. Uh, in the first place, speculating that Joyce might have uh, an autoimmune hereditary disease called lupus the, because her sisters had it, the city went to court to try to force her to undergo a spinal tap, a CAT scan, and blood tests against her will to see whether she might have the disease. Joyce, who knew well what the symptoms were because of her family's history, knew that she didn't have lupus, but she did consult an expert in the field who said she didn't have lupus and uh, that the spinal tap was grossly out of the question. It wasn't necessary. A blood test would confirm whether or not further tests were necessary. The city characterized her refusal to undergo a spinal tap as being a further indication that she was mentally ill and unable to care for herself. The city also tried to take, force her to take powerful, mind-altering antipsychotic drugs, even though there was substantial testimony that she wasn't psychotic, even though Joyce believed that there were, uh, and there is medical authority for this, that those drugs may have uh, potential serious and long-lasting side effects, and even though she had personal reasons for not wanting to, to take drugs. The city again dismissed these objections as indications of her disturbed psyche and her lack of judgment and insight. Again, after a trial at which the trial judge saw her and had an opportunity to see what she was really like, as you will, the judge found that she had the capacity to make a reasoned decision about whether to refuse or accept treatment, and the city was uh, not permitted to medicate her. Shortly afterwards, the city let her go. In explanation, as I suggested before, the city said, every patient at Bellevue is being medicated. If Joyce Brown isn't going to be medicated, there's nothing we can do for her. <clears throat> the ward psychiatrist testified at the time of her release that her mental condition was exactly the same as it was at the time that she was admitted to the hospital, and that if released, she would deteriorate within three or four days and become suicidal. You can judge for yourselves. I'd like to leave you with several questions. The first question is, what is the proper balance between the individual's fundamental right to liberty and society's duty to be compassionate towards those who cannot care for themselves? It, it's a basic tenet of our constitutional sy system that no individual may be deprived of liberty without due process of law. 
although we acknowledge the relevance of that tenet in cases involving criminal defendants, we have been less willing to recognize the need for similar safeguards when the confinement is to a mental hospital rather than a prison, and the purpose of confinement is ostensibly benevolent rather than punitive. Uh, yet, involuntary commitment to a mental hospital is a massive deprivation of liberty. The consequences in terms of liberty violations are as severe as if one went to prison. Secondly, why was Joyce Brown picked up? After all, she'd lived on the street for one and a half years. She'd eaten well, she'd kept herself warm, she was in good physical health. Why was she confined? And I think you might want to ask yourselves that question. One, one reason which the city had advanced was that because uh, Mayor Koch had wanted to modify the commitment standard in New York State without legislative approval uh, and permit people who were not dangerous to themselves or others to be hospitalized, he, he then authorized someone who was not currently dangerous but might be at some hypothetical future date on the speculation of a psychiatrist, a danger to herself or others. What is the effect, finally, of what has happened in terms of our sense of Joyce Brown and of this case after she was released from the hospital? And the question I think we should all ask of ourselves tonight is what does it say about our society that we have chosen to make of Joyce Brown as intelligent, articulate, and interesting and outstanding a person as she is into a celebrity of, which is not of her own making. Uh, more, the recent press coverage, and I don't mean to knock the press, but the, but the recent coverage has been more about what she eats, where she goes shopping, uh, and questions like that, rather than the more serious questions, which I think she is all about, uh, which have to do with who are homeless people, how did they become homeless, and what can we do about the enormous problems of homelessness in our society. Are we saying that somehow Joyce Brown is okay, we can all breathe a sigh of relief, the homeless are okay, we don't need to worry about this problem anymore? Are we sweeping this problem under the rug in a way because we don't want to deal with it and we'd rather turn uh, our homeless people into celebrities than uh, listen to what they have to say about the serious problems of homelessness? Homelessness is a complex and multifaceted social problem which resists easy solutions. We too should resist the easy solutions like sweeping people up off the street like Joyce Brown and we should listen to the message that people like Joyce Brown are trying to give us and not try to make them into people who conform to our image of what a homeless person should be. With that, I'd like to introduce Joyce Brown. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. It's a long way from the street at 65th and 2nd Avenue in New York City. I wish to thank the students at Harvard Law School for inviting me and my lawyers here tonight. Many people, especially New Yorkers, have been very supportive of my struggle for freedom. People sometimes say that New Yorkers are cold. That wasn't true regarding my battle. New Yorkers have been warm, supportive, and encouraging. I wish to public, publicly thank all the people who have been so supportive of me. The homeless crisis, a street view, can be summed up very simply. The homeless situation is a national disgrace. It never should have gotten to the point where it is today. Millions of people have gotten, who are homeless, in New York City alone, there are 50 to 80,000 homeless. We must do something about it immediately. What we, what we must do is understand that the main reason we have this homeless crisis is because there isn't enough affordable low-income housing. Very simply, we need housing, housing, and more housing. We need low-income housing. We need affordable low-income in housing. If we create low-income housing, then many homeless people won't be homeless any longer. It's that simple. In New York City and other cities across this country, housing policies by politicians have led to this homeless crisis. They help create the crisis with their policies that help the rich, not the poor. 
the housing policies help disgrace poor people so that the rich can live in fancy co-ops and condos. We need, we need to take the boarded up buildings and rehabilitate them. Let the homeless get trained by union workers and private construction companies so that they can have the skills to rehabilitate the buildings and then the homeless people can live in the buildings. We should stop the buildings of shelters. Shelters are not homes. Shelters are not safe. More and more New York homeless people are rejecting shelters. You see homeless people everywhere in your own neighborhood on heating grates, park benches, subway stations, bus depots, store doorways, or just walking the streets. If shelters were any good, people would not be out on the street. They would prefer the shelters to the streets. We should put the money and resources into building low-income permanent housing, not temporary shelters. <coughs> My ex experience at shelters, not good at all. I'd rather be on the street. The shelters were dangerous. The people in the shelters, you don't know who you're sleeping next to. There have been murders, thefts, rapings, and it's a very ugly place to live. My experience on the street, my street view. I panhandled for money to buy my food to eat. I ate chicken cutlet every day. I had a quart of juice, ice cream, and my heating system was a hot air vent that was, the hot air was coming out of Swenson's restaurant. My clothes were dirty, nasty, malodorous, disheveled. I had the best friends any person could have on the inside or on the outside. My friends were all professional. They were doctors, they were lawyers, they were nurses, teachers, etc. My experience with the police. The police have a policy of police brutality. The police beat me, the police kicked me, the police hit me with their nightsticks, the police twisted my arms, they did everything but spit on me. I hate the police. I hate the police. My experience with Project Help, there in Mayor Koch's administration, they were the ones who picked me up. They harassed me constantly, continuously. They took me from the street. They would bring me to the hospital, Metropolitan Hospital. I was brought there several times, about 10 times within a year. They did nothing as far as offering assistance in finding housing. The only thing they wanted to do for me was giving me a sandwich and a carton of milk. I was picked up under Mayor Kachi's program. I was the wrong one to be picked up. I should not have been picked up. And I prove that because I am now here before you tonight. My 84-day struggle to be free, my incarceration under Mayor Kachi's plan. I was a political prisoner. Mayor Koch was using political strategy in which homeless people just being on the street, sleeping with your face on the ground, having to panhandle for money, having to urinate and defecate on the street because you can't use restaurants, their toilet facilities. That should be enough, but no, Mayor Koch turns around, he wants to compound the problem by picking you up against your will, violating your human rights, your dignity, 
degrading you, humiliating you, embarrassing you, and bringing you to the hospital against your will and try to force you to take either drugs, medical treatment. I was in and out of the hospital, in and out of court, rather, for the entire 84 days I was there. I was uh, under a tremendous amount of stress trying to prove that I was sane, that it was my choice to live on the street. It was my right to live on the street if that's what I chose to do. I did not commit a crime. My problem was I didn't have anywhere to live. And that's the city's fault. Every time I went to court, and each and every hearing that I had concerning my case, I won. I won it for myself. My lawyer would always tell me, when you take the stand, you're going to be your own best witness. I can have experts from this field. I can have character witnesses, your friends. But when you take the stand, you're going to win it for yourself. And that's exactly the way it went. I won it for myself. The last 24 days since being out of Bellevue Hospital, I have been on TV talk shows. I've been interviewed by the newspapers. I've worked at my lawyer's offices, the New York Civil Liberties Union, and I'm now living at Traveler's Hotel, which is located on 40th Street in City. What I now want is an apartment, one, two, a job working with people, I get along very good with people. I'm a very likable person. I had many friends while I was on the street, and I still have the same friends now. The only thing that was wrong with me when I was on the street was I didn't have a, a job, I didn't have anywhere to live, and my clothes were dirty. But mentally, I was the same person that I am today, and I have clean clothes on today. Three, love. Everyone wants love, and I want it too. I will continue to speak out on the homeless crisis wherever and whenever with the hope that no one else has to go through what I did, being treated like an animal and not like a human being. My constitutional rights were violated. The experience was embarrassing, degrading, humiliating, and I have never, I have been scarred mentally from the ordeal. I will never, ever, 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 ever forget what happened to me and what Mayor Koch's program did to me. Also, maybe I can help others. Maybe I can bring attention to the homeless crisis and maybe we can build a low income housing so that homeless people need not be homeless any longer. Maybe some of you who will become lawyers for the homeless, maybe you can help make things better. Maybe we can end the homeless crisis. I hope so. Thank you. Urban areas all across this country have undergone massive redevelopment over the past 10 to 15 years. A city or community in which large-scale luxury development occurs may reap some benefits. The quality of the housing stock may improve. Additional businesses may be brought into the area, and a city's tax base may increase. However, Development also brings serious and substantial problems for poor people. We end up paying a high price for this redevelopment, this gentrification. Large commercial and luxury residential developments in downtown areas frequently result in the loss of available housing and displacement of the poor. 
As an example, a development project may cause direct displacement of people from the site of the development, or reduce services, harassment, and dramatic rent increases may threaten tenants in nearby areas, thereby causing what has now been termed secondary displacement. The consequence of either situation is that tenants are forced to leave their homes, and often with no place to go, a significant number of these tenants who happen to be poor become part of the ever-increasing homeless population in America. For example, in my town, New York City, mostly in Manhattan, we lost approximately 100,000 SRO units, single room occupancy units, which was a last resort for poor people. We lost 100,000 SRO units from the mid 70s to the mid 80s. SROs were torn down or converted to luxury high rise residential housing. The poor were displaced and pushed out in record numbers. Since the city did not adequately plan for alternative low income housing, the displaced became the homeless. Approximately one third of all the folks in the shelters in New York list an SRO as their last residence. You don't have to be a walking around genius to figure out that when a city like New York loses 100,000 low-income units like SROs, that's where the homeless problem comes from. Inevitably, many of the homeless are rejecting the shelters that have been created in the favor of the streets, which they find to be safer and less confining. A poor alternative, but the best one that they have. The challenge for government officials in New York, in this town, in towns all across this country, and this challenge is an immediate one, not one that can wait five years or 10 years, is to create viable options for the street homeless. The issue cannot be living in the streets or locked up against your will in a mental institution. If viable options are created, low-income housing, halfway houses, and as Joyce said, not shelters, because as the people on the streets are saying now, shelters are not homes. If these options are created, then many homeless people will jump at the opportunity to be homeless no longer. Joyce Brown has become a symbol of the failure of government policies in the 80s for the poor and the homeless. To the politicians like Mayor Ed Koch and the public, I say, let's stop once and for all the demagoguery on these very serious issues. Let's stop the diversions from government's failure to create available, affordable, low-income housing and viable community mental health programs. And let's begin to address constitutionally, legally, and realistically the growing unacceptable homeless crisis. 25 years ago, people of goodwill throughout this country expressed their commitment to racial equality by having activists and lawyers go to southern communities to protect the constitutional rights of blacks in that part of this country. Today, I submit the commitment to racial and economic equality means that we must send activists, lawyers, law students, and people of goodwill in all professions into our urban streets, the train and bus stations, to learn about the problems of the homeless and to seek solutions to this horrible situation. It's long overdue, but we must face the following crisis and dilemma. We must together 
my generation of legal activists and your generation of legal activists to come. We must address economic justice. For 30 years, we've extended the Due Process and Equal Protection Clause to political and social rights for groups that were powerless. We now, as we begin the 90s, must take the due process and the equal protection gains and extend it into the arena of economic justice. It's long overdue. Very quickly, because we want to get to the questions, some quick solutions. In every town in this country, you'll see boarded up buildings. In our town, one of the largest, if not the largest, landlord is the city of New York. It owns 10,000 what's called in-rem buildings. We must take that housing stock and we must rehabilitate. The city of New York, and I would probably submit if I knew more, that cities all across this country also as landlords, warehouse apartments. In the city of New York, there are thousands of warehouse apartments tonight. If we could get the keys, the homeless could go there tonight. We don't have to wait six months or a year. We need the keys. Third, in this town, and Mayor Flynn has played somewhat of a leadership role on developing the linkage concept City officials all across this country must be persuaded to develop and implement remedial measures which could ameliorate the harsh impact of urban redevelopment on housing available to the poor. I believe the government, the cities, the state, and the feds have not provided meaningful housing programs for people displaced by gentrification and redevelopment. This town is pioneering San Francisco has it on the books for six years. It's a housing development trust fund concept. If the developers want to build those monsters in the downtown areas, the city should say, we want dollars back in exchange for the approval to build the luxury high rises and the commercial developments in the downtown arena. It's an economic channeling, but this economic channeling seems only fair when one understands that the development that I'm talking about is a direct and demonstrable cause for the displacement and dislocation and the eventual growing homeless population that lives in the streets. Key to any effective policy relating homelessness is a demonstration by city and state officials that they care about homeless people. In my experience in the last three winters, being out on the streets at least a hundred times, except for seeing one city council person two times in the city of New York, mainly in Manhattan, I've never seen a city, state official getting out on the streets and talking to homeless people as real people. They've got stereotypes and myths that they perpetuate about homeless people. I'm here to tell you, they're real people like you and I, and most of them, not all of them, are down on their luck. And it's important to show that compassion. I've learned a lot about homeless people in the last three years. And I'll continue to advocate as strong as I can and as effective, hopefully, as I can. And the Civil Liberties Union in New York will commit resources to this fight because we have learned from homeless people themselves many things that you can't learn even in the halls of Harvard. These are real people. They're street smart. We've learned. Where the hell are the fucking politicians? The city and state officials who claim they care. If they cared, they'd be out there in the streets learning from these people. 
Because if they listened, they'd understand that these people have rights too. And these people want what all of us want. They want a place to live. They want a decent job. And they want to be part of the system. And that should not be a threat. And yet, the Pauls ignore and misunderstand this very simple and eloquent message. So where does it leave us? It leaves us as gadflies. And hopefully some of you as the future gadflies to use the due process and equal protection in the state constitutions and create guerrilla legal strategies to say to them that until you do these things, we'll fight you in the courts, we'll fight you in the public arenas, and we'll fight you in the legislation because we're not going to allow you to sweep this issue away and we're not going to allow you to take an economic and political issue and make it either a mental health issue or a law enforcement issue. Watch that last part for the future. More and more people are talking about arresting homeless people, incarcerating homeless people. Your generation can't allow that to happen. Hopefully, your generation, Rob, Danny, and my generation, and other people will work together to turn this issue around and deal with the core, which is economic justice and fairness for all, once and for all, in this country. Thank you. Joyce and Norman and Rob will, are willing to take whatever questions you have. We ask that you just use the microphones and uh, take turns. Hi, my name is Thomas Main. I'm a student at the Kennedy School of Government. And uh, I've done some research on the issue of homelessness in New York City. Uh, and I think that you're addressing some ver very real issues. There's a real uh, dilemma. But I, I want to ex mention an incident that happened to me when I went out a couple of years ago with Project Help. I was doing a study of sort of how they operate. We uh, came up to one person. It's a man. He's literally bent over like this. Hair was matted. Uh, seemed very dirty. I, l later it turned out he had lice. Uh, when the psychiatrist spoke to him, he didn't know his name. He didn't know what year it was. And then the psychiatrist walked away. And I said, well, aren't you going to do anything? He said, no. The person is in no immediate danger to himself. Now, undoubtedly, housing is part of the issue here. No one, anyone who tries to sweep that under the rug is, is quite wrong. On the other hand, there will always be some people like that gentleman I ran into, even with the, the best housing environment. And furthermore, I think that you've, you've exaggerated the extent to which the housing problem causes the homelessness. For example, it's not true that one-third of the people in the shelters came from SROs. It turns out that the numbers immediately came from SROs. The number is less than 10 percent the last study I saw. But however that may be, how do you respond to the statement, to the, to the question that uh, perhaps your, the obstacles that you put in the way of trying to do something, maybe not give them a spinal tap or something like that or force medication, but somehow coax this person in with a little bit of uh, 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 force, if necessary, that you're actually uh, resulting in some of these people you know, freezing to death on the street and going berserk on the Staten Island Ferry and stabbing people. With two incidents which have in fact happened. I wonder how you respond to that. To, Joyce, to, to Joyce Brown's attorneys, or to, or to Joyce Brown, whoever you know, chooses to respond. Well, I think, I think all of us may have different responses. You raise a number of issues. I'm not. Let me start at the beginning. No one here is saying that government does not have the power to involuntarily hospitalize people who are mentally ill and dangerous to themselves or others. There have already been decisions on that. The laws are on the books. We have not challenged that at this point. I mean, those cases have already been fought. 
issue with Mayor Koch's program is not whether or not psychiatrists can come up to someone like Joyce Brown and say, we'd like you to go to a hospital. We, w we would like you to get help. The issue is whether or not a person who is not dangerous to herself or others and whose conduct is, in the opinion of the psychiatrist, bizarre, shall be deprived of liberty. And our, psychiatry, our society has drawn a balance between individual rights and our duty to be compassionate. And I think we all have, uh, we know that the meat of constitutional law is, is how one balances competing interests. Uh, and we have drawn that line there. I think it is not an unreasonable balance. I don't think it prevents anyone from getting treatment who should really have it. And I think that if you look at the realities of the situation, the mayor's pro first of all, Project Help uh, has not really been providing long-term help for people. What what should have been done uh, for people like Joyce Brown or people like the, the people you're talking about is to provide a place where they can get the services they need, to provide housing that they need, provide mental health services they need. The mayor's program provides for 28 beds in one hospital in in Manhattan. It, the jurisdiction of Project Help, since you brought it up, was below uh, 96th Street on the east side and 110th Street on the west side. And for those of you who know New York, that jurisdiction meant that uh, the city, in effect, was picking up homeless people only in, in relatively affluent areas. And it led many of us to believe that this was, in effect, a cosmetic and uh, a program to, to pick up people who appeared to be offensive. We all know that there are homeless people in Harlem, in, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, in uh, the South Bronx, in Queens, and, and other places. And the problem with this program was that it, was, it did not address the real problems of homelessness or of the homeless mentally ill. Uh, there is a shortage of psychiatric hospital beds in New York City for people who really need help. Those who, there are people who go into mental hospitals in New York City, and we have clients, we brought a lawsuit on their behalf who say that they're hearing voices telling them to kill people or to kill themselves and that they want help. And they have been refused admission in one case and, uh, and in other cases, well, in many cases. And in other cases, they're forced to wait for long periods of times in the emergency room without getting beds. A 28-bed program that designates homeless people who aren't dangerous as the people who will occupy these wards at $600 a day is not going to solve the problems of the homeless or of the homeless mental ill. And I think I can go on with, with a number of different examples. But uh, I think the theme is the same. Um, I like to answer uh, your question concerning Project Help. When I was on the street, Project Help took me to the hospital roughly um, nine, ten times. They would always have the police with them. They would handcuff me, have me turn around drop my belongings, they would put handcuffs on me and cart me off to the hospital. Now, I didn't commit a crime. I shouldn't have been handcuffed by then. They had, the police have kicked me in my leg. Is that any way to treat a human being? They're supposed to be professionals, the police. They have kicked me in my leg, and I'm a woman, and they wear these hard, heavy boots. They have hit me with their nightsticks. The police have choked me. They have ganged up on me, two and three policemen at one time. Here I am, a woman weighing 115 pounds. The police have abused me along with Project Help. That's the help, the project. And um, <laughs> against the police, everyone knows that the police, uh, that's what they practice. Everyone knows they beat, everyone knows they kill, everyone knows what the police are about. I mean, let's not play games. We all know what the police are about. And uh, they're supposed to be, they're called professionals. The police are not professionals. They are high school grads or GED. Since when is that a professional? <laughs> Finish. Let me, let me quick, uh, when you ask the questions and you make it open. First, with regard to your statistic about 10%, I think that's grossly uh, low, but if you'll show me your study, uh, and if I'm wrong on the one-third, I'll stand corrected. But let, let me go to another point that's relevant to that and very connected to it, at least in New York City, and I think all over the country. New York City evicts about 28,000 people a year. Uh, 
Danny just mentioned something to me, a study by the New York Department of Social Services that said something about 60% of the people in the shelters wound up in the shelters because somewhere in their immediate past they were evicted. Uh, now, whether that number is correct or not, your eyebrows went up. The point that I would make is that a significant percentage of the people in the shelters came from that process. We are ready, and hopefully all across this country, other lawyers will do similar, try to establish a new right, a right to counsel in the landlord-tenant courts when the consequence of the proceeding is the loss of your apartment. We have to, consistent with economic justice, recognize, even though it's a civil proceeding, that the loss of someone's apartment in the city of New York with the housing crisis as it is in 1988 is a fundamental deprivation of one's constitutional rights. And we have to go back and remember 30 or 40 years ago when the rights that some of us take for granted today weren't on the books. We have to think that way to solve this problem because the Pauls aren't doing it. The part about how maybe we are creating the problems, well, my point about that I don't see the officials out there, if they were there in a good faith effort trying to do some of the positive things, maybe I wouldn't be that militant and angry. And finally, with the guy that you talked about, Rob explained it real well so I don't have to go into it in great detail. I've been out there, I've seen that guy. I've seen people in worse shape. And when we convince them and work hard and winning over their trusts, because the modern day lawyer also has to be somewhat of an organizer. Out of the 60s movement, knowing how to work with poor folks, not just give them a lecture about the law, but listen and try to help, sometimes even in a heresy way, non-legal solutions and non-legal responses and being human. Now, when we convince that guy after night after night in the cold to come with me to Bellevue, there's no beds there. We've been in court for over two years against the city of New York, fighting to get beds for the guy that you talked about. And the city fights us tooth and nail over that issue. Is that good faith? And finally, the freezing part, because it's raised to me every once in a while. It's the head of the New York Civil Liberties Union. Guy died last night. Some people actually say, don't you feel good? You killed him. Well, let me tell you, I come out of a humanistic movement. I'm a lawyer because I care about folks. And the structure doesn't give a shit about them very often. And the people that I care about, they don't have very much power. And when someone dies out on the street, it eats me up inside. But you know, no, we didn't cause that. It's the issues that I talked about before. And we will, our only remedy is to do as best we can in trying to prevent those things from happening. And the way you prevent those things from happening is giving people options. When Joyce, after three weeks that Rob and I got to know her, and the issue initially in the case was the right to return to 65th and 2nd. When we found the travelers on 40th and 8th, and it wasn't the city of New York that found the bed for her. When we found the bed with the help of Council Gurgis, I have to give him some credit on that, it took a half a second for her to say, yes, I'll go there. If I had more beds and facilities like the Travelers, that I could go back to New York tonight and had 100 beds, and I got off the plane at midnight, by 12.30, there'd be 100 people less 
in the street of New York. And that's the problem. My name is Judy Chamberlain. Uh, I'm a member of the... I'm a member of the Mental Patients Liberation Front of Boston and the National Alliance of Mental Patients. And uh, I think a lot of what we've heard here tonight is very important, but I think the most important thing that we've heard is that we shouldn't be drawing a distinction that is very much too often drawn in the press and in a lot of the literature about homelessness between two seemingly different groups of people, the homeless and the homeless mentally ill. And I think that uh, what we've heard tonight is that there's basically one group of people uh, and that if we start making special programs uh, for people labeled homelessly mentally ill, we've given away the game before we've even started. Uh, I just uh, today was reading something by a psychiatrist named Richard Lamb who was saying that these, this group of people, the homeless mentally ill, they can't live in their own apartments. They'll never be able to manage. We've got to put them in programs. Their problems aren't economic. Ordinary homeless people's problems are economic. Homelessly, the homelessly mentally ill are a whole separate group of people with different problems and different solutions. And we've got to see those two groups as one group. They are not two separate groups. They don't have two separate solutions. And I think that the thrust of, of the remarks of uh, both uh, Ms. Brown and her attorneys was about homeless people and not separating out people on the basis of, of, a, of a supposed diagnosis and saying that therefore the problems are different. The American Psychiatric Association um, put a, uh, uh, compiled a, a report on homeless and mentally ill in which they acknowledged that homelessness was a problem linked to housing crisis and gentrification and so forth, uh, but that the problems with homeless and mentally ill had nothing to do with that. And I would like uh, to ask the question of how can we uh, attack this um, this myth that has been thrust on the public, largely through the media, that there's this special group of people, uh, quote unquote, the homeless mentally ill, uh, who aren't part of the general homeless uh, population and therefore have a whole separate uh, set of solutions. I think part of the answer isn't hearing people like Joyce Brown, because here is someone that the the, uh, the city of New York was saying uh, uh, without psychiatric treatment couldn't function. And I think there isn't a person in this room who agrees with that. But I'd like to ask you this question of how, would, how do we fight this view that there's this distinct psychiatric population with special problems and special solutions? Yes, uh, or, or every, any, anyone who wants to respond. I can't really answer that question. That, that's a dilemma that we've all had for years. And uh, historically, I think that institutions like prisons and mental hospitals have been the repositories of our social problems. And I think we have to begin to, to look at who the homeless are, what their problems are as homeless, rather than problems of uh, our stereotype of, of who they are. Beyond that, I, I can't give a good answer as to how we change people's consciousnesses. Nothing special other than it's a hard process. It's one-on-one, -on -one, it's one-on-200, it's writing stories, op-ed pieces, letters to the editors, talking to your neighbors, uh, and it's a tireless uh, endeavor. But I do believe that that kind of advocacy over an extended period of time does bring about changes in people's public perception. I know that, and I take some uh, sense of uh, feeling of accomplishment over the last four months, that when we began this fight, the kind of calls and letters we were getting in the office compared to what we're now getting, that doesn't mean that everybody still loves what we're doing, but I think the public consciousness has changed a little on this issue, and I think more and more people, for example, going back four years ago and where we are now, I do believe, contrary to the gentleman's comments before, that more and more people are understanding, including the media, that is playing an important role in letting the public understand that the homelessness issue is a housing issue. Four years ago, we weren't even at first base on that. And now I think we're much further along. That doesn't mean that we stop. We've got to keep doing the things that I mentioned before. And uh, I think we'll get there. 
I want, I'd like to add uh, one thing to it. Before I became homeless, I was employed as a secretary. Working for 18 years, I've worked for lawyers, PhDs, directors, and um, while I was on the street, about two blocks down the street from where I lived, there was a woman on the street and she was a registered nurse. Where I live right now, today, at Traveler's Hotel, there are intelligent, articulate women who have worked in offices, who have contributed to society in their lives. Um, their ages range from uh, 25 to 65. So therefore they have worked before. How they became homeless, I don't know because uh, everyone arrives on, his, on the street different ways. And um, you don't have to be mentally ill to be homeless. Uh, Tom Brokaw did a very good uh, story on the today's homeless. There are people being driven to the street because of no housing. There are people being driven to the street because of unemployment. There are people being driven to the streets because of um, companies where they work moving outside of the country. And um, so in this day and age, you will find a lot of intelligent people on the street. And because you see someone on the sidewalk, and because you look at their clothes and they're dirty, it's not what you have on the outside, it's what you have on the inside that counts. My name is Carlos Gonzalez, one of the founders of Ten City. I'm one of the founders of the Congress of the Homeless of Boston and Cambridge. And I've been homeless for 13 months myself. I've been arrested 11 times in the last three months, mostly for trespass. I ran for the City Council of Cambridge this last year. It's a pity that we have to send to New York to hear the story of homelessness, when right here in Cambridge, in Boston, we have plenty, plenty of cases. I've been labeled schizoparanoid, schizophrenic, chronic, many, many years ago. I'm sorry, but I was asked to just ask a question. I just found this out about two hours ago, and I have a lot of anger in me, a lot of compassion though. Ten City was a chance that we had, and was sold out by the principals here of MIT and the City Council and the landlords. Joyce, you're right, you know. Not everybody that gets in the street is mentally ill, but anybody that stays in the street for over a week becomes mentally ill. I challenge anybody to show that a homeless person can be a law-abiding citizen. In the city of Cambridge, if you have to take a piss and you're dirty and you can't go to a restaurant, there's no public facilities, you get arrested for in public indecency. If you have no place to go and you need a drink because the pain of the suffering that you have is only abated by the drink and you take the drink in your home, which is your clothes, you get arrested for public drinking. You get arrested for almost everything. In the summer, here, the winter you have shelters here for the winter months. Come March 1st, April 1st, the shelters close. Any place in Cambridge that you sleep in, you're arrested for trespassing. Cambridge is becoming a city of the elite. I understand most of you are lawyers. I've been going pro se myself because the legal situation here in Cambridge gives you two minutes to talk to a lawyer and in those two minutes you're supposed to be able to explain the situation you have in. I don't know, I, I can only cry. I can only cry because we don't need to send away. Right here in the cities of Cambridge, you know, you can talk to people that came out of 10th city, you know, that are homeless and crying and they're good people, damn it, they're damn good people. And they're people that if they're young, they can become doctors and lawyers in a society that would be more humane, that doesn't de dehumanize it with all the institutional aspects. A question, finally. Norman. <laughs> I'm a dropout from the third grade, so you have to excuse me. You're doing great. Yeah, well, I've been doing great for 20 years. 
I'm down in the streets. I got six cases that I'm fighting, and you know, so uh, I'm not doing that great. Norman, how can people that are students here get involved in the nitty-gritty work? Because when I went to prison, in jail, and I've been in Berica, I've been in Tombs, I've been in Rikers Island, all for things that are homeless people done. Excuse me. I just left the storefront that we took over. We have 13 people flopping there that we are funding ourselves, that we collected stemming. Stemming means panhandling. You get arrested for panhandling in Cambridge because you can't, you don't want welfare, and you want to ask the Christian charity of your fellow brother, you're arrested in Cambridge. If you're arrested in Cambridge very often for anything. In fact, Cambridge actually doesn't have a problem of homelessness. Cambridge has built homes for the homeless. They're called jails. And there's a round, round merry-go-round, which is not so merry. They put you in jail for 30 days, out you go for two days, in you go again. Excuse me, I'm taking a lot of time. I didn't ask a question yet. people want to ask questions. Norman. I got you. Comment. Okay. Let me just make two or three comments and then ask the direct question. First, very important. Uh, the gentleman talked about trespass. Uh, the other one is loitering. Uh, is he gone? Okay. Uh, the uh, we just yesterday uh, won a decision in the New York Court of Appeals that threw out the loitering provision. Uh, that the police were using to arrest homeless people in places like the Port Authority, Penn Station, and Grand Central. And the trespass law is the next one that has to be challenged. Those kinds of statutes give the law enforcement people too much discretion. And what happens Read Papa Christie, 1972 Supreme Court decision that declared vagrancy unconstitutional. The gist of what this is about is that the government cannot make status a crime. Conduct has to be a crime. And so what we have to do is those of us who are in this uh, arena and have chosen to be lawyers have to look and understand who makes those laws, what they're intended for, and then hear this gentleman's uh, plea and figure out how we can protect him because he shouldn't be busted for being homeless. The second thing about urinating and defecating, and one of the things about Joyce's case that people in those letters that I was talking about, including the mayor, being obsessed about was the urinating and defecating on the streets. There's no public restrooms. Other cities, most notably in Europe, have good public restrooms and public showers. Now, if people in this country are afraid we're going to turn into something that they don't want us to turn into as far as governments, at a minimum, recognize the emergency crisis of homelessness in this country and for the next two years appropriate funds to open up public showers and bathrooms and restrooms so that people don't have to urinate and defecate in their clothes or on the streets. It's a very easy and humane thing to do, and yet we don't do it. The, the students and the parts about, first of all, if he's still here, on the six cases that you've got going right now, we're going to be here at least until tomorrow morning. If you'll stay here, I'll talk with you about the six cases, and then I'll go a next step. We'll be tomorrow at breakfast at 8.30 or 9, and if there's any students who want to work on some of those cases, we'll quickly evaluate them tonight and try to hook some of the students up. And the last thing, when I was getting up, Danny wanted to uh, add something about uh, the question about how students can work with the gentleman. I think he's absolutely right. Uh, you don't really need to send for us from New York to come to Cambridge or Boston to deal with the homeless problem. You've got thousands of very articulate homeless people in this town. And you have to, in this town, even if you're a student for a while, ask the questions, how did that occur? 
And what you'll find is that in Boston and Cambridge, your homeless problem is probably uh, very similar in its genesis as to our homeless problem. And once you find that out, you've got a personal question of whether or not you're going to do something about it. There is so much opportunity. It's challenging legally and also on a personal level. It is one of the cutting issues of America today. And I think that I challenge you to participate and work with this gentleman. And hopefully, we'll talk about the cases tonight. And then maybe we can get you some resources. If I can't get it from here, maybe I can get the Boston Civil Liberties Union to give you a hand. And if worse comes, we'll have some long distance phone calls. OK? <clears throat> I also want to say this. Um, I want to be very concrete to people who are at Harvard Law School and have come tonight to hear this and have feelings about what it is that you could do. This is an amazing place. To come here after being in legal services and see the resources of this school as compared to legal services office is amazing. And there is a large degree of alienation. And I hear it time and time again from students who are public interest oriented. The reality is that Harvard is no different than the world in which we live, which is that there are enormous numbers of things that can be done, notwithstanding the fact that most people or many people who get out of here go to work at large firms. From the day that you come here, there are student practice organizations that represent homeless people. There's the Legal Aid Bureau. There are courses with clinical placements at the Jamaica Plains Center. There are other courses de directly dealing with the larger issues of homelessness. There is the most extraordinary program here in which if you go into public interest law, the law school will pay back most of the loans that you've taken out, one of the most generous loan forgiveness programs in the country, so that those who say, I can't work at the Civil Liberties Union, I can't work at Greater Boston Legal Services, I have $30,000 in loans, it is simply untrue. The school this year is paying back $300,000 dollars of people who have chosen to go the route of public interest law and it is a viable real opportunity for you to make that long-term decision that you will walk away from the Wall Street law firms and I assure you have a much more interesting much more enjoyable much more rewarding life of doing it so this is not a sit here and clap every once in a while and then go back and feel bad this is your life this is what it's about. You've chosen to be lawyers. You're not going to bring the class action lawsuit to abolish capitalism. It won't succeed even if you bring it. Even if you bring it, you'll be thrown out on procedural grounds. But the reality is that the problems of economics and the problems of individual people are absolutely ones that lawyers have a role in dealing with. And it is the challenge to listen to the people who've spoken tonight and say when you, when you leave here, that you're going to commit yourself to doing some of the very important work. Harvard may be alienating in lots of ways, but it's an alienating place with lots of resources, and it's willing to spend them if you challenge it, and that becomes your challenge, not to listen to what goes on here, but to use what's available to you to make the difference that's important. My question is um, directed towards Mr. Levy. Um, what, if anything, is being done? You mentioned that 18 other homeless people were also picked up under similar circumstances. Um, what, if anything, is being done for them? Are you was the lawsuit that was brought on behalf of George Brown a class action on behalf of everyone that was picked up, or um, if not, what is being done for them? We had hoped that, well, let me tell you procedurally. Joyce Prong petitioned for her release from the hospital. She didn't file a separate class action lawsuit challenging the program. We had hoped that the courts would have ruled that the city was simply applying the wrong constitutional standard for picking Joyce up. Uh, and our hopes, I guess, were somewhat dashed a couple of weeks ago when the State Court of Appeals ruled that Joyce's case was moot, even though the case had been fully argued and briefed before her, and even though the lower courts were begging for guidance 
guidance from the State Court of Appeals. We think that the state law as it's written clearly uh, outlaws what the mayor is doing right now. And you know, it's, at some point, uh, we can't tell you exactly when that will happen. There will be another challenge to this program. There are two other people who have challenged their, their hospitalization and in effect won. Uh, one person was sent to a long-term state hospital in New York State, uh, or was supposed to be sent there, instead of to a community halfway house, the way the program had initially proposed. The, she asked for a hearing to contest that. The judge not only said she shouldn't go to the hospital, the judge said that uh, she, shouldn't, she, she shouldn't be in any hospital at all and ordered her released. But unfortunately, the city again got a stay, and that case is on appeal. So we, we expect we'll be involved in that at some point, too. Hi, my name is Brian Margolis. I'm a law school student here. Uh, the question is directed primarily to Mr. Siegel, although anybody on the panel should feel free to answer. Uh, in your remarks, you uh, quite appropriately laid the blame for a large part of the problem of the homeless at the doorstep of the city of New York under the current mayor and, and also the state of New York. Uh, I presume you're referring to the deinstitutionalization which occurred in the 70s and up to the early 80s. Uh, I noticed a silence with regards to federal government uh, and I was wondering if you could comment both, I mean, more specifically, uh, I guess the question is, given your goal of, of uh, eradicating homelessness by providing housing to people who need, to low-income uh, people, uh, what extent is this a federal, is this a state, is this a city uh, solution, county? It's like a law school question. Uh, all of the above. Uh, and I left the feds out only because I think it was uh, uh, just uh, everybody understands that the major, uh, when you're dealing with national homelessness, the major culprit is the Reagan administration. And I just assumed that everybody knew that. Maybe I should not have. Uh, I think, though, my point has been that when Ronald Reagan came to the White House in 1981, uh, you didn't have to have a Harvard degree to understand that these kinds of issues were going to be ignored by the Reagan administration. And we have not been proven uh, incorrect. Uh, what I'm angry about is why the cities and the states across this country let that agenda go on. I wanted to see leadership from the municipal and state levels enforcing a confrontation on the national level over issues such as homelessness. What also baffles me is that I have not seen up to this point, although I did see two months ago Joe Kennedy and Ray Flynn writing an op-ed piece in the New York Times, and they were the first ones who I think understood that there is a national constituency that can be organized around this issue that could be very important for the future of America. Uh, what has baffled me is that no political leaders have emerged in taking this issue and making it a national issue. Example, the debates that go on right now on the Dems and the Reps, I don't hear these kinds of issues being discussed. And I do believe that there are A, important issues, and B, there's an incredible constituency out there waiting to be organized politically to change this. And getting back to your point, I would have liked to have seen, and if the feds don't change, I'd like to see the kind of grassroots organizing and marches on Washington and lobbying of Congress around the broader issue of economic justice, but specifically now on homelessness. And by leaving out the feds, uh, I didn't want to say that they're not part of it. Uh, a lot of money used to come for low income and moderate income housing. It doesn't come anymore. We have to make that happen and have to extend it in even more creative and effective ways than has ever happened before. The press has been patiently waiting to ask some questions, so we're going to open it up for the press right now. And if anybody else wants to ask questions, they, they're welcome to after the press. I'd like to. Well, we promised the press nine times. I'd like to call. I'd like to have a question. I. 
I have to press this button right. Oh, thank you, Carlos. Um, I've been dying to ask some one, a few questions and a few announcements. One, uh, Saturday is Homeless Awareness Day, started by the Boston Union of the Homeless. Uh, all day at the Salvation Army and at 7.30 at the Sanders Theater. I'd like to mention also that a Cambridge chapter of the Union of the Homeless is being formed right here in Cambridge and that we will need help from people with a law background. Um, we are now beginning to assert ourselves more to take charge, homeless people themselves, rather than social workers, uh, per se, or people who are acting for the homeless. So um, that is one thing I'd also like to briefly read something. Do you, do you have a question? My question is my announcement. My question is to thank Joyce Brown for speaking here today. I think you're a beautiful, wonderful person, and I love you, and God bless you. And I'd, um, I'd like to read this poem. It was in the book. Uh, the we got the juice cut off. Where's the electric? Okay, we're back on. Hello. Um, when you're homeless in Boston, to be homeless is to be homeless is to be left out, to be left out in the cold, to be alone and sad, to be kicked like a dog, spinning around like a top that's lost its head to the tunes of a long midnight. When the cold winds hit to the bone, the bitter reality to be a to be or not to be. All that I know now is to keep moving, to know the warm stop spots, bus station, library, airport, and train station. A master of transportation depots am I. When you're homeless in Boston, you play megabytes every night at the shelter. Maybe your number will be drawn so you can get a flop for the night. When you're homeless in Boston, you become accustomed to writing fiction on your job application when addresses and phone numbers are asked. When you're homeless in Boston and staying at one of the shelters, you are told when to sleep, wake up, eat, and shower. When you're homeless in Boston, you stop believing in yourself, in God, and in your country. You become ultra cynical and bitter. Then you start saying stuff out loud in public places or on the streets. People laugh at you, and you become their entertainment. Soon the mind becomes a jumble of mass fragments that seem unpeaceable. For when you are homeless in Boston, you stand in phone booths calling agencies and rental companies. When, you're, when you get the agency, they are polite, tell you to come to their office, talk, leave, and so much for the agencies. When you are homeless in Boston, you go to the labor pool and work for the minimum wage, which is slavery when we consider the dollar's purchasing power. Troubled and distressed by what I see and experience as you, condo developer, rush off to your next deal, and you, real estate man, rubbing your hands at the profits of, after, of course, you dispose of the last tenants, the new Boston, the quiche Lorraine tier and the arrogant wealth of the nouveau riche, sucking the life, um, yeah, I made, espresso bars and slick talking fools, sucking the lifeblood from the land. Through this horror of real estate speculation, we can see, clearly see the life, blood, the juice, the very soul being taken out of the city. But remember, my friends, not long ago you started something. That tea, you threw it overboard. Come on now, have you forgotten? Standing in phone booths, talking to the wind, smoking a cigarette. Standing in front of booths, calling for help and calling to God. Um, that was written in Widener Library one year ago. I've been barred from Widener Library because I used the locker there to keep my clothes. Thank you. Are there any questions from the press? Okay, well, thank you for coming. There is, oh, okay. Um, I just want to say, I, I'll, I'll make this brief. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been working for two years at the Ruby Rogers Center, along with Judy Chamberlain. And uh, 
I would like to uh, say that I housed the, the mayor of 10 City in my apartment for two weeks, and uh, I, have, I have a roommate that's doing a thesis on uh, on 10 City. Also, um, I'd like to ask Joyce Brown what she thinks about um, Project Bread, Church of All Nations, that's run by Jewish synagogue people. Okay, what she thinks of church shelters with carpets and various other things that aren't quite so brutal as Parker Street Shelter. In other words, I'd like to ask her what she thinks of some of the um, church uh, shelters uh, as opposed to some of the, you know, Armory and uh, Lindemann Center shelters. Do you know what I mean by Lindemann Center? It's a metropolitan, uh, it's in a gym in downtown Boston. Well, I, was a, I was a guest there at one point. I don't like shelters at all. I have been in church it's, shelter. It's, well, yeah, I okay. have been in a church shelter, and um, they treat you like children. Uh, they try to control you, these nuns, with this uh, discipline, and um, I didn't like it at all. As I said, I know the inside and the out. I know about having an apartment because I once had one before. I know about the streets. I know about shelters and um, just how the system works. Um, I want an I want an apartment, a place to live. A shelter is not a place to live. A shelter is uh, just temporary quarters, and um, I don't want that. I want permanent housing. I'll try to make this brief. I'm Constantine Christus Bazakas. I'm a member of the Harvard College class of 49. I'm also the Port Lowry to Phyllis Brooks House, an unofficial liaison to the homeless, an author of about 10, 1,000 poems, including the Golden Class of 88 for this year's graduating class, written last Saturday, and about uh, 10 for the homeless. I'd like to say that a similar experience happened to me, where under the influence of McCarthyism and Harvard deans and psychiatrists, I was illegally lured into the mental wards in 56 and 7 of two veterans' hospitals in Tucson and Sepulveda and almost murdered by McCarthyism. My brain and body were terrifically damaged. I was turned into a vegetable. At age 31, I looked like 17. Five months later, I looked like 70. I'd become a big, fat, old-looking fella. And yet the dean of the law school is a classmate. No professor, I beg for help ever came to my assistance here to try to save my late Jewish girlfriend, the great painter, who was also labeled under anti-Semitism, McCarthyism, and, who, and whose cousin, Joe Court, class of 50, was in a communist study class and caused her to be labeled. Now, most of my troubles have been recorded in my own self-prepared U.S. Supreme Court writ of certiorari, February 75, which went through the Harvard Law School torts court in 1980, according to freshman Weldon Williams, it's Bazakas versus the government, U.S. Supreme Court writ of certiorari 758060. Now, nobody at the law school has climbed out of their ostrich-like sand holes to do anything for me, and yet many nights I don't sleep, I have to lay in bed until 9 or 10, and then I can rewrite or revise or edit a poem in 10 or 20 minutes. Then it takes five hours to type up 100 copies or so. The question is, what are you people in the law school doing instead of just studying to be highly paid mushrooms for the big corporations? Are you interested in the 63-year-old guy that served in 10 battles, eight beaches in the war with the 158 Arizona Infantry that was called General Custer Bazooka, the best man in the regiment, who was degraded by his own country, never belonged to the Communist Party, and was destroyed and rendered unemployed most of the years from 21 to 63. What are you doing? It's a challenge. There's millions involved, but what I'd like to have is the years back, my youth and health, the chance to marry. I'm engaged to a Yugoslavian nurse. If she ever finds a story, she might say, darling, it's all over. So I'd like to ask you, I commend her, and I'm the author of Ode to Melody, Cass, Elmer, Lewis, Harry Tubman, a lot of poems. Uh, why doesn't the law school climb out of its cocoon? The dean of the law school is my classmate and do something for me instead of doing a lot of fancy footwork and making believe through false motions they're helping the homeless. When a depression comes in great force in two or three years or one, 
everybody's going to be starving in the road. And Harvard will have to close up because there won't be enough dividends. The question to you is, where is justice? How about justice for me? Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Muchas gracias, amigo. Thank you. Question? Do you have a question? I do have a question. Uh, my name is Donna Mosh, and I'm the director of mental health in the state of Rhode Island. And I'm one of those individuals in whose office are vested those very serious powers to confine people against their will because of a mental illness or some alleged act. Um, I'd like to ask, given that there are uh, 38 states in which there's legislation now pending, much of which describes a revised commitment law that would make people committable by virtue of the fact that they could not feed, clothe, or shelter themselves, what plans the Civil Liberties Union and other attorneys might have to take some action? It's not action that's obvious and bold, such as that which uh, Mayor Koch has taken, but it's action that's going to have some very pervasive of consequences, and how are you going to assist homeless people to find their voice to resist this kind of invasion and to appropriately limit the powers of people such as myself? Well, first of all, the, the second part, the way homeless people are going to be able to resist that is be, when homeless people begin to organize themselves and speak for themselves as a political force in this town, in my town, and all across the country. And that's starting to happen. Uh, the Sunday night before Christmas in New York, there was a march called to walk down 57th in front of Trump Towers, in front of Plaza Hotel. 5,000 people showed up. Next Saturday, a week from this Saturday, February, whatever it is, uh, the 27th in Atlanta, uh, there's going to be a march and rally around homelessness, and I'm told there's going to be 10,000 people from all over the South coming. I think it's the beginning of a movement of homeless people and homeless uh, activists and friends to create a movement to say, we're not taking this crap anymore. And you're going to have more and more people speaking who are homeless. And I think that's the way homeless people speak out. The second thing with regard to what the Civil Liberties Union will do is that we in New York will continue to try to persuade all the other civil liberties unions around the country to do what we're doing and make this issue a priority from one, a liberty perspective, dealing with the mental health laws, and second, from an economic justice area. And all I can say to people like yourself, if, that, if the Rhode Island Civil Liberties Union is not going to play an active role or there's not enough resources and your state is moving towards reinstitutionalization, uh, call me collect. Uh, call me after your hours and we will talk and we will try from New York as best we can to try to stop that kind of movement. I'm frightened that what Koch is trying to do in New York is the first step in reinstitutionalization. And even though I will acknowledge that there are serious problems with deinstitutionalization, the answer to the problems of deinstitutionalization is not reinstitutionalization, but to get back where we were 20 years ago, where the states promised to build the community halfway houses, and if necessary, litigate that issue affirmatively, and second, with the homeless themselves, create a political issue around that promise. I'd just like to add uh, sort of a supplementary perspective, and that is that people like you who really are involved in the mental health field and who oppose broadening the commitment standards can have a tremendous effect. We can appeal for a sense of justice and civil liberties and to organize people, but we really, I think legislators listen to dollar and, dollars and cents and to pragmatism. And there are studies that show what happens when you broaden the commitment standards. You have uh, overcrowding of the hospitals, people brought into the mental health system who shouldn't be there, people who need help not getting beds, just as that is in New York City. Uh, and I think that people like you who are professionals can bring those studies out and show the legislators it's going to cost much more money to do that. In the end, it's defeating.
I, I make one brief comment and reply. I think all of that is true, and many of us are speaking out. However, our voices are considered to be somewhat in conflict in that uh, our motives may be suspected from a variety, depending on who's looking at it from a variety of points of view. And uh, I believe that as people who are homeless themselves and courageous people like Ms. Brown, who have got to speak out and uh, be heard, because this really is a human rights issue. And running what I consider to be fine facilities myself, I can say that several weeks stay in a psychiatric hospital will solve no social and economic problem. That's all we have time for tonight. Thank you for coming.